Thank you very much. Thank you kindly. I'm indeed honored to share the platform with such distinguished guests and of course to be invited to share this time with you this evening. I'm happy you could take the time to come out today for such a very important occasion. And I'd like to congratulate this organization for putting at the center of its name ancestral commemoration. That is a very, very important uh, idea and concept because as I will try to demonstrate later, this is about more than mere commemoration as is often done. We are about, frankly, transformation. We, in coming here today, are in a process of transforming ourselves. We are engaging in a psychotherapeutic encounter in which our personalities are being transformed, in which our consciousness is being transformed, in which we are preparing to transform the power relations that now characterize the world. I'd like to give you a give thanks for your support in terms of our publications, Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, The uh, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children, Understanding Black Adolescent Male Violence, Black on Black Violence, Black Self-Annihilation in Service of White Domination. And this is a, a thing that's going on all over the globe. We see it in Rwanda, we've seen it in South Africa, we see it everywhere. Because you have to recognize, too often we begin our analysis without looking at the context in which the phenomena we are analyzing are occurring. And as I said in Black on Black, often we follow the European scheme of decontextualizing the subject matter. That is, talking about it as if it does not exist within a social system and a political system. So we talk about the black family as if it exists in a vacuum and is not shaped by the political and economic circumstances in which it exists, you see. And you get a lot of ignorant talk about values, as if values are not created by political and economic systems. And so we're gonna change the values of the black family without changing the very values and the nature of American society itself, mm -hmm. you see. And now we have somebody who claims that they are going to reduce illegitimacy. <laughs> uh, Clinton. <laughs> it's an amazing situation. Not recognizing the fact that white teenagers are producing the highest so-called illegitimacy rate in the country. You have white teenagers producing some 250,000 children pouring out of wedlock in this very year. This is well over 100,000 more than, than uh, African Americans. We got it, and, and, and if you look at this situation, talked about values. Behind white values is a plan for death. Yes. Just as behind any kind of white morality is death and damnation for African people. You want to come out and tell people you should not have children unless you're able to take care of them. And then you turn around to see to it that they can't take care of them. You see. So you want to tell the men, don't create children unless you can take care of them. And then you spend the time seeing to it that they're not employed to take care of the children. Then what ultimately are you asking? If they follow what you are projecting as a moral rule, then ultimately what you're asking the race to do is to what? To die. To die. To fade away. Don't be deceived then by apparent appeals to morality. One of these days I will talk to you about European and Eurocentric morality and demonstrate to you how 
behind each of their moral uh, strictures and prescriptions lies a death plan for African people. You must come to understand that if people are in a hateful relationship with you, that the object of hate ultimately is destruction. The object of love, of course, is growth and development and expansion, enhancement. The object of hatred is then death and destruction. But the interesting thing about hatred is that it can often disguise itself as love. You see, it is no accident in a metaphorical sense as to why the devil in the Bible was perceived as the most handsome angel. Because evil comes wrapped up as something very, very attractive. And that's why people fall into it. For a sin were as ugly as people talked about it and painful and, and apparently dirty as people talked about it, we wouldn't have much of a problem rejecting it. It's because it looks good to us before we realize what it really is about. The very essence of evil and the very essence of the devil is what? Deception. The devil is known as the great deceiver. Beware of white men on a moral crusade. Yes, because their original motives are still hidden and disguised. In the moral crusade to reduce crime and criminality in America, of course, is death and imprisonment for black men and ultimately death for black people. But that's another story. We're looking forward, of course, to publishing our new book, Blueprint for Black Power, in about two months. We're going to give you plenty of reading, about 600 pages of it, so you can get ready, you know, for to curl up uh, and get your winter reading together. Because to a great extent, a lot of the issues that we complain about, a lot of the complaints we make, and a lot of the problems we discuss, essentially are problems that reflect relative powerlessness. And this is a subject matter that which people don't like to talk about very much. We've been made to think that power is evil and its pursuit is evil. And many of us have been made to think that power is intrinsically something that is possessed by white people, or at least non-African people. And this is tragic, because power is at the very center of life. For without power, there is no life. The very fact that we stand up means that we have to have power to struggle against gravity's attempt to hold us flat to the earth. Power has to do with the ability to do things, the ability to walk, to talk, to eat, to do all of the things we do require power. And therefore, when we talk about our inability to do certain things and to transform our situation, we are talking about power or the lack of it, in one form or the other. We have some interesting theories out here and some interesting analyses, which truthfully point to certain situations. But we have to look again. It may be that the white man treats us the way he does, and I don't doubt it because he's seeking to protect his genes and gene pool. It may be that he is as aggressive and heartless as he is because he comes from an ice continent. It may be that he does what he does because he is hateful. However, in the end, I think a more fundamental approach to this issue is that the white man does what he does because he can do it. What do I care about a white man's genes? 
<laughs> what do I care about his penis envy? <laughs> what can we do about it? Cut it short? <laughs> what do I care if he hates me? What are we going to do? Try to get him to love us? What if he never loves us? What do I care if he's cold and heartless? Try to heat him up? <laughs> In the end, it really doesn't matter with what the fundamental cause of his behavior is. In the end, he does what he does because he can and because we have not yet developed the means to do what? To stop it. And he will stop doing what he does when we decide to end it and bring his rulership to a close. Yes, this is what it's about. Not make excuses for his misbehavior. Not give a damn about whether he hates or whether he loves or whether he's cold or whether he's out. But to end his capacity to rule over our people. And until this day, we have black men out here who are going to decide that the ultimate mission at this point is to end their rulership by white men. This is not going to change. Hmm. Yeah, you got to end it and fight this man and this boy, this white man and white boy, toe to toe. That's right. No respecting, self respecting group of men will place the feeding of their families in the hands of another ethnic group. No self-respecting group of men can inherit the wealth of the earth and, and the genius that I talk about in developmental psychology of the black child and depend on their being employed by a bunch of white guys. Yeah. How dare you call yourself men and you're not about the process of destroying the power of white men over you. You can't be about manhood and not be about the destruction of white male power because that power threatens the whole of life on earth. While it is good that we analyze the sexuality concerning balls, <laughs> basketballs, and that's very truthful analysis, very much to the point, balls going into various holes and that you know, speaks very much to the issue. I have no problem with that critique. So this is not a, a critique. But there's the larger part of the game that must be paid attention to as well. And recognize that basketball, football, soccer, and other things are primal male games. And ultimately are games of war and involve themselves about the defense of territory. The line that runs down the center of the basketball court is a border line. It separates two antagonistic forces. And the major problem there is to defend your territory against incursions from the other side. And to what? invade and take from the other what one must take in order to win and to survive. And it's interesting to see a whole psychology operating there. The psychology of teamwork, the psychology of organization, the psychology of morale, the psychology of hierarchy with captains and guards other people operating there to defend territory and to defeat the enemy. And yet to see black men play that game and miss all the points. To see black men walk on that court and call themselves by one name, Bulls and Bullets and Knicks and Celtics, <laughs> to take one name and operate under that name identify with that name, be proud of that name, organize around that name. And on top of that, 
to dress just the like in uniforms. Yes, to organize themselves and sit down and plot strategy and tactics, to study the nature of the enemy and seek to defend, defeat that enemy. Isn't it amazing that black men can go on these courts and on these football fields? playing these primordial games of men and the games that reflect the realities of life and cannot play them in real life. <laughs> and can only play them under the courtship and the management of white men. <laughs> <laughs> Create billions of dollars of wealth playing for pennies. Five million dollars a year is no money when you're creating two and three billion or more. Going into a ring knocking another man's brains out for 20 million dollars is no money when the match itself generates over 200 million to 300 million dollars. And you got a bunch of jokers out there living vicariously through this battle. And so you've got a bunch of men who will take one name, bulls and so forth, and wear one uniform. And when they come off the court, you say then, why don't we call ourselves African? I'm an individual. <laughs> you say, I, you know, all of a sudden we're individuals. We, we're not connected. We, we are in, interbred with all kinds of races and groups. And yet, this is, you, this is how you make your money. This is how the thing works out. So there's a larger psychology there. So we get young black males who will attack other ethnic group males with their kids just for walking down the street. They'll attack each other. I was talking to, to a lady the other day, a mother the other day, about her son who is literally locked within his own neighborhood because if he crosses the street that way, the gang that belongs to that project will attack him. And if he goes the other way, that one will attack him. You know, territoriality. Territoriality. Turf, as they say. Isn't it interesting then that men and black men and young black boys can have this sense of territoriality? But when they become grown men, Arabs can walk into the neighborhood and take their money and take their women. Koreans walk into the neighborhood, take their weapon, take their money, impoverish their children. All other ethnic groups just walk in and freely take and win and rule over them. What happens to the sense of territoriality? But yet you go into these courts and you play into the midnights protecting territory. Someone must have psyched your mind out. You're not approaching these games correctly. The game you're playing is the game played on you. Let's understand that. Therefore, you must study the dynamics of power. And confront it for real because it's the only thing that's going to keep you alive. There's no guarantee that you will be alive except that you fight to stay alive. We got some jokers out here who want to depend on Jesus. Just depend on the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> then they want to tell you, we're all God's children. He loves us equally. <laughs> My God. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the Indians think about that, huh? God loved me the same as he loved white folk. And I'm being decimated. As you mentioned the Tasmanians. Yes, the aboriginals on Australia, and God is supposed to love what? All of us equally? You better rethink that again. What kind of love is that? Reminds me again, you see, if you're going to read this Bible, you've got to read it right. As we read in Exodus, God promises these people a land. Promises them the land, right? And what has got to happen? When they get to the border, he just doesn't say, step right up and step right in. You're home, does he? 
You got to do what? You got to take it. You got to fight for it. You got to exterminate the people who are already there. Come on, let's face it. That's what's going on there. You got to fight for it. I promised it to you, but you got to do what? You got to fight for it. You got to fight for it. Some of them went in there and got spooked out. I think he sent over 12 to spy and to surveil the land. Ten of them came back. We can't beat them. They're invincible. They're giants. They're this. You know, pretty much the way a lot of us look at white people today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There were only two that said, we can beat them. Isn't it amazing? The land was promised, and yet they had doubt. God had to keep them in the wilderness another 40 years to where, so that he could just destroy the doubters. And only those who said, we can win despite the overwhelming forces. We can win despite the fact that they look invincible, achieve the promised land. We got a lot of black men out here rolling in the highways and byways, overcome by addictions and various other things because they've reached the conclusion that the white man is invincible that the white man cannot be defeated. Perhaps we are in our exodus where these cowards are dying. And perhaps those who will be left will be those who have made up their minds that he can be defeated. So we must study power. We're going to come out after that. Of course, with educating black children for the 21st century rationale for an African-centered education, another 400 pages. Because African people are as complicated as any other people. You know, we tend to think that we can write about African people in 25 words or less. <laughs> you know, other people have libraries dedicated to them, and <laughs> they build libraries dealing with themselves and their issues, and we want little books written in little language. <laughs> No, no, we have complicated issues to confront. We must recognize that we have to change the education of our children. We're going to move rapidly here in light of the time. We want to get back here. I want to speak to those who say we should forget the past. What does slavery have to do with it? You see, why are we talking about slavery? That's in the past. Let's face the reality here, ladies and gentlemen, that the present that these people try to tell us to deal with is but the leading edge of the past. The past is what is brought to the present. How do we come to the present except from the past? The present is in great part a dynamic creation of the past. It is the past that the present is made of. The things on this earth, the minerals and all the other things from which we make new objects, were created billions of years ago. In reality, there is nothing new. We are all billions of years old because we are made of star stuff. We only or in our present forms within the chronology of years. But the atoms of which we are made have been here since the beginning. And in essence then, we are the same age as is the universe, because we are, in effect, the universe. It is artificial then to seek to separate the past from the present. The nervous system which mediates the present, this brain, these nerves which interpret the present, react to the present, deal with our current circumstances, these nerves have been organized. And they have been organized when? In the past. We learn to walk in the past, we learn to talk in the past, we learn to do almost everything we do 
in the past, and yet we are doing it where? In the present, and we will do it in the future. But it is because we fall victim to the European demarcation of time. Because time does not have to be looked at as linear, as having a past, present, and future. We can look at time as a simultaneous existence. One of the major things we have to transform as African people when we gain control of ourselves and of our destiny is to transform the way time is defined. I don't have time to talk about that today, but at the Center of Educating Black Children for the 21st Century, I talk about the fact that it is the time system in the educational structure that is destroying black children. The fact that we have inherited it, European time. We talk about grades, which is a time concept, without recognizing we can define a grade to last any length and period of time we want to. We take achievement tests and other tests based on what? Time system, inherited it from other people. When you look throughout that system then, you will see to a great extent, our children being destroyed because we have not questioned the time structures under which they operate. Look at how you feel when you say that you are late for work. Look at how your heart rate changes, your blood pressure changes. Look at how even your mental system begins to become disorganized. In other words, then time is not just an abstract intellectual concept, it has concrete influences on the mental organization of people, on their behavioral organization, upon their very bodies themselves. And when you then let another people in, impose a time system on you, they are then working on your mentality and your very physiology. And our children there are being driven crazy and we ourselves being driven crazy because we are operating within the time units of other people. Every culture has a time dimension connected to it. CP time is serious time, but we got to understand how that time is intrinsically related to us. We ridicule it in a way because we think European time is the only time there is in the world. In the human mind, then, the past is always present. Where do you think history is? Out there, per se? Where do you think it is? History is where? in your head. If man did not exist, if he were not alive, history would be pointless. And if history exists in our brains and in our minds, then that means history is present. And that means history operates in the here and now. The unconscious that we talk about and that we see that operates and motivates our behavior. The unconscious is the forgotten past operating in the present. Simply because you don't remember it does not mean that it's not operating and transforming your behavior. We know that unconscious history and unconscious experiences, though long forgotten, still influence the way people behave, the way they see the world, the way they interact with the world. I want to impress you with one other thing. There are a lot of people who want to forget history. And thinking and forgetting history, they are escaping its effects. <laughs> you know, in physics, they talk about something called antimatter. Not matter. But it does matter. <laughs> It is what? Real. Even though it's antimatter. The unreal real. Carrying a charge and carrying a spin. And it's a part of the calculations of physics. Well, we have something we call anti-knowledge, I guess. In other words, ignorance. But ladies and gentlemen, ignorance is not just an absence of knowledge. It is a real force in the personality. You behave differently when you're ignorant of something 
than when you what? Know it. So ignorance itself has a palpable and measurable effect on real behavior. And therefore, an ignorance of your history, an ignorance of slavery, does not permit you to escape its effects. That ignorance itself becomes a part of your very behavior and the very way you approach the world and deal with the world. You can't escape it, whether you try to forget it or not. If you seek to forget the history of slavery and not study it, thinking that you have thereby escaped its influences, let me remind you that you have not escaped its influences. Because one thing, you must know enough about it to want to escape it. You see? So every time I read it, I get mad, I get nervous, I get anxious, I feel bad, I feel inferior, I feel this way or that way. That's why I don't want to know about it. Well, you know enough about it to feel that way about it. It means then that if you are leaving, if you are not studying that history because you are afraid of it, because you want to, you're suffering from anxiety and dealing with it, if it means that you don't want to come to terms with the history because you are seeking to deny reality, you, you're seeking to distort your present existence, you're seeking to live in some kind of fantasy and some kind of false hope, then it means that you're being motivated by negative forces. It means your life then becomes organized by fear. It becomes organized by escape. It becomes organized by denial. In other words, in, 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 in seeking to escape the history, in, in trying try, try to deal with its fears and anxiety, escape fears and anxiety, denial become primary motivating forces in your personality. So again, you don't escape it, even if you think you don't know it. And the personality then becomes taken over by negativity, and you become, 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 become a, by escape, which reduces your capacity to learn from experience and reduces your capacity to deal positively with your existence and to, and to, and to transform life and to, 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 to transform the world. And, you, and witness the confusion that occurs as a result now of operating in a whole new world that they did not exist in before. Witness the problems they have when they can no longer apply the knowledge that they had learned in the, the, the original world, world, world in the new, the new world. Problems and powerlessness they suffer as long as they have not figured out the parameters of the new world that they've been snapped into all of a sudden. How they are then at the, at the behest of those who are ruling the new world because they don't know how it operates and they don't know how to operate in it because everything they've learned before or, or longer of any value. When we talk about slavery then and enslavement of African people, we are talking about a time warp. Think about the world, 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 world and our ancestors lived in prior to the slave trade. Think about the consciousness that they existed in. Think the religions and the cultures and the values and the dress and the taste and the perceptions of reality, their interaction with the world, their social relations, their social institutions. Think about all those things and then think about capture, the middle passage, slavery itself and colonialism which forms the time warp. And when they go through that warp, they're in a new world in which they never existed before. And this is the world we are in today. This is the world we share with our ancestors. We are on the other side of the veil. We are in a new consciousness where African tradition now is a very difficult thing to call on, where we cannot call on our African gods where we have not yet been able to use our African institutions as effectively as we used them before. 
Think about these ancestors as they, they moved into a whole new world, a whole new way of working, a whole new set of values, a whole new set of time systems, a whole new language system, economic system, social system, set of social relations, and so forth. And literally overnight, they're into this world. And think of the tremendous stress that was required for them to try to adjust as they saw their older systems no longer functional in the new world. We are still in that condition right now. We are still struggling with it today. How dare you then say that that's in the past and that nothing has nothing to do with you. Ask yourself the question, why are you speaking the language we speak today? Is this an African language you, I'm speaking here now? Is this the language that we would have been speaking had we been on the other side of the veil? Is this the language that was forced upon our ancestors and our slave ancestors? And isn't this the same language you're speaking now? Then how do you say you are not connected with the slave experience when you speak a slave language at this very moment? Slavery was no mere taking advantage of the labor of black people, the mere use of black bodies. Slavery was a period of mass transformation of consciousness, was a transformation of culture, was a transformation of the African personality. Slavery involved the niggerization of African people. It involved opening up the African personality and introjecting it a, a possessing spirit that now we call nigger. We didn't know anything about nigger until we got over here. And then you lay all the, what are the characteristics? And you see us acting it out day in and day out in our street and everywhere. What kind of values do we have today? Are those the original values? Or are those the values taught our slave ancestors and ourselves? What kind of God are we giving praise to? Are they original God? Or is the religion we have now a religion given to us in slavery? What kind of family organization do we complain about? What are the dynamics that go on in the black family today if those dynamics were not determined? by our being going through the time war of slavery. Even when you had a black man and a black woman in the, in the field, and you, you, they may have consummated a marriage and children, it was still not a duplicate of the white man and white woman's marriage because the family was a slave family. And the dynamics of being a slave family changed the relationship between the man and his wife and the man and his children and even today, the black man's relationship to his black wife and his relationship to his children is still not a duplicate of the white man's relationship to his wife or to his children because we are still a servant people and those dynamics enter into our social relations with our families and our people. How dare you say then that your living today is in no way connected to the past. We are the past. We and our ancestors are one and the same because we share the same experience. We speak the same language. We are an alienated people. What does that mean? Those of us who have forgotten history have forgotten ourselves. That means we have become estranged and distant from ourselves as a people. And therefore African culture appears to be as us an alien culture, a strange culture. This is the essence, you see. We have little familiarity with it. We do not feel at home with it. Where do you think this process began? It began in slavery and it still operates today. To be alienated also means to exist for the benefit of aliens. That's why you're alienated in the first place. When aliens capture you, they must ultimately alienate you to adapt you to their demands. 
That is why when we spend our monies in these streets today, when we have neighborhoods that are 100% black, we can only support alien merchants. Yes. And when we go to work, we can only work for alien people. <laughs> and when we are educated, we are educated to qualify for alien companies and alien corporations. There has been no basic change since slavery. The essence of slavery is servitude. And the black man is still a servant today. You're in us and we are just as much servants and operating to the benefit of the white man today as our slave great-great-grandparents did in the past. Don't be deceived by your little profession. There's nothing changed in this situation. We have not yet come out of slavery. As I mentioned yesterday on the radio at the very bottom of black education, at the very, at the very, what I call the, and what I talk about in educating black children for the 21st century, when I talk about the explicit curriculum and the implicit curriculum, the hidden curriculum, behind every curriculum in America is the assumption that black people are being trained to work for white folk. That's right. The whole organization of every school, primary, secondary, child care, daycare, whatever it is, operates on the assumption that we are here to work for white folk. Yes, every course, everything is set around that issue, that we will serve white folk, that white folk will provide us with the jobs, that white folk will protect our interests, that we are here to benefit white folk, and we are concerned then about how we can best qualify to meet the criteria demanded by white folk. In other words then, in getting our degrees and getting our education, we are preparing to put ourselves on the slave block and ask whites to bid the highest prices based on our qualifications. You must understand that a true education, a true African-centered education is an education that centers itself on African issues and African liberation, not working for white folk. That is truly concerned then that puts African concerns at the center of the educational process. And ultimately it's concerned with disempowering white folk. And it's ultimately concerned with employing ourselves and creating our own job and gaining control of our own destiny. We have to then ask what criteria must we meet? Must we socialize ourselves? Must we educate ourselves in? in order to become the people we must become, in order to solve the problems we must solve. This is the essence of what an African-centered education is about. Because if an African-centered education does not solve your problem, it is not an education. If being trained in computer science and technology and white law and all the other things ultimately cannot protect your very biological existence, if these things cannot remove your dependency on another people for your very life and for your very bread, then you're being miseducated. I don't care where you get the education from. As we look here then, we can see that past the time war, we were brought into a new consciousness, an alienated consciousness, speaking a new tongue, operating and motivated in terms of new values, religion, family organization and dynamics. We saw ourselves in a way we'd never seen ourselves before. We define ourselves now in ways we've never defined ourselves before. We're engaged in social relations the like of which we never engaged in before. We are caught in servitude, still in servitude, and it is the intention of the white man that we never come out of servitude until he no longer needs us and decides to uh, create genocide against us. We now have new learning styles because the, our whole cognitive way of thinking and our whole way of processing information has been transformed by the slave experience. 
That's why I tell you, you can't have, have an appropriate African-centered education until you have an appropriate theory of learning because our very ways of thinking and reasoning and so forth was transformed by the slave experience. And one of the major problems we have in the educational institution today is that the way our children are taught and the way we are approached uh, in terms of education has nothing to do with the way we are organized in terms of the way we think and behave and are motivated. There's a complete opposition between the way the school is designed and the way we are designed as people and have been designed by the slave experience and the experience in America. There's nothing wrong with African children. Black children do not come to school. Black children do not come to school behind white children. They come to school as they are. What does this imply then? It implies then that it is the school that needs to be what? Transformed, not the African child. But once you know that what we've experienced is a psycho history, not a mere history and experience, but a psychological transformation, when you talk about education then, you will design a theory of pedagogy, a method of teaching that is in line with the psychology that has been created by the slave experience. And one that says, I know how this mind is structured as a result of that experience. How do we want to restructure that mind so that it can achieve the things we need to achieve? What do you mean then? And here we have what? New tastes new foods, even our soul foods reflect the slave experience. Those foods we find so satisfying to our palates. We have new names and new identities, and you dare say the past had nothing to do with you. What kind of lies are you going to continue to tell yourself? The forms of government in which we are under today in the United States were created while we were slaves. We're still operating with them. The physical structures and the buildings and the layout of the land and organization of the land is still there. They are frozen history, but history that canalized our very existence. How can Nelson Mandela talk about forget the past when the whole past, the highways and the buildings and the law and the structure, <laughs> all, all creations of the past are still structuring African life today. And you're going to forget the past. <laughs> We are in a new consciousness. I want you, you, when you read this next book coming, I'm going to talk about consciousness. Consciousness is power. Consciousness is the means by which people adapt to the world and adapt the world to themselves. Consciousness is based on history and experience. It is based on methods of processing information and processing that information which comes out of history and experience in ways to solve problems. Consciousness involves values which gives consciousness direction and purpose and goals. What we have done then is let another people determine the content of our consciousness, the information that's in our consciousness, so that when we seek to behave, if that information is false, if that information is irrelevant, if that information is inadequate, even if we have good brains and good thought patterns, even if we can reason, we're going to reason on false premises and misdirect our behavior. You understand what I'm saying? Even if you can think and reason well, and even if you have solid facts, but your values are wrong. You understand? If your tastes are wrong, if your desires are wrong, if your needs are wrong, even with that capacity to reason logically and to reason analytically and critically, even with the facts in your mind, you're going to still come out misbehaving and behaving against your interests because you're going to behave in a way to achieve values that have been inculcated in you by another people. And therefore, when you let another people inculcate values and create needs as they do through the media and create desires and so forth, then even with factual knowledge and even with a, a top-notch logical mind, you will still be self-destructive. So those Henry Louis Gates, those Cornell West, and those other people who think they've learned the knacks of syllogisms 
I think they've learned the knack of philosophical thinking and critical analysis because they values are given to them by the white man. They still end up supporting the white power over them. I will end it here. I will end it here. Why do we commemorate this day? What is this commemoration about? It is to enhance our awareness because ultimately awareness is remembering, bringing back the parts which have been separated by the time warps of time, reconnecting across the veil and creating new continuities. When we talk about Africa prior to the slave trade and when we concentrate on that time warp and when we look at where we are now, we are remembering and reconnecting and creating continuities that transform our personalities and our organization and social relations as a people. When we recall, we call back from the forgotten past and reconnect it with the present so that it can be of use to us now and in the future. When we commemorate, we recognize the past, which means we also rethink and recognize ourselves and recognize the present and recognize the future and in doing so change these things. We recollect and we recreate. We become new creatures and take new names and take new values and take new goals and orientations and create new desires and new wishes and hopes and so forth. This is what we do when we commemorate, when we look at that middle passage. We are looking at this situation here then where we go back into the time war and instead of letting it be under the control of Europeans and let ourselves be the accidental reflection of that time warp, we look at that time warp again, we look at the mid-passage, we look at our capturing in slavery, we look at them and reframe them, restructure them, reorganize them, and in restructuring them, reframing them, we change the consciousness that they created originally, and we thereby become self-creating and self-determining. And then now, instead of being controlled by that time warp, instead of being controlled by that forgotten slave experience, of being controlled by that middle passage, because we come to know it, because we recall it, because we bring it up and re-examine it and restructure it and reinterpret it, instead of then being controlled by it, we thereby, through this analysis, gain control over our consciousness and through it gain control over our behavior and through it gain control over our destiny as a people. We make the unconscious conscious and if consciousness is power, we regain power. We are in the process then this evening of empowering ourselves because what makes an African-centered consciousness an African-centered consciousness is a consciousness based on African history and culture and the African experience, based on knowledge relevant to African people and African issues, based on solid African information and other information relevant to our liberation as a people and self-control as a people. It means gaining control of our information processes, our thinking systems, our analytical faculties so that they can process this African-centered knowledge and information in a way that it solves African-centered problems and having African-centered values so that when we seek to satisfy those values, when we seek to satisfy our desires with your African desires, when we seek to satisfy those needs which have been generated by African selves, we then empower African people we then enrich African people because where your values are, there is your money, there is your sweat and blood. That is why the European then has our young people valuing Nike sneakers. Sneakers that only cost of $5.60 to manufacture. Sneakers for which Indonesian women are paid $1.35 a day. Sneakers for which Michael Jordan has paid $20 million to advertise. Enough money to pay the whole Indonesian workforce that makes the sneakers 
and you got African young men out here in the street killing each other so that they can buy them because someone has created in them a value for these pieces of rubber. They sell drugs and they kill and they mock. Why? Because they've let a white man put into their minds that these junks are nothing of value of such value. Why is it you think freedom is doing what you want to do? Then why is it everything you want to do? You gotta pay aliens to do it. Because they put the values in your mind. They've created the desires in your mind. So consequently, you see, when you desire things African, when you need things African, you see, you destroy European power that depends upon you trying to satisfy the desires that they put in. You understand? And if they're African desires, if they're African needs, if they're African values, and fulfilling them, you enrich and empower African people. This is what we are about here tonight. We are connecting ourselves again to our greatest source of power, and that is our African past to create our African future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.